Welcome to What the Paper Said, in which I, Patrick Crozier, skim through the times from a hundred years ago, read some of the articles, and comment on the ones I find interesting. In this episode, the week ending the 10th of June, 1923, notes from the workers' paradise, notes from the free market paradise, and the FBI gets royal approval. But first, the headlines. Britain has a new Member of Parliament. A new woman Member of Parliament. In the 6th of May episode, I mentioned that the Liberal Member of Parliament for Berwick had lost his seat and was barred from standing again owing to his agent's misreporting of election expenses. So he got his wife to stand. But there was a fly in the ointment. Mabel Philipson would only stand as a Conservative. Anyway, she's won. On the 20th of May, I mentioned that uh, New York State was considering abolishing its prohibition laws. And uh, this week we learned that, well, it has gone and done it, which amazes me um, because this is in appears to be in complete defiance of the uh, American Constitution. Prohibition was a constitutional amendment. Uh, and it, it's... I don't know what happens next. We'll have to read. Um, Wikipedia doesn't help us on this, so uh, there you go. Uh, there's a rent bill before Parliament, which uh, slight makes it slightly easier for landlords to uh, raise their rent. And the derby was won by Papyrus. In other news, uh, the Times has an article about um, the dilemma facing Mussolini. Uh, essentially, it says that... Uh, what he wants is, is a dictatorship, but he would rather have some sort of uh, parliamentary veneer uh, to it if he, if he can possibly get it. In the 24, 25th of March episode, I mentioned that there was a deputation, deputation from India to talk about the Kenyan government. Uh, may sound a bit peculiar. Uh, what it is, is the Indian uh, community are demanding... Uh, um, are demanding the vote in Kenya and um, the British government is saying yes here have a vote for your own parliament and they're saying no we demand equality and uh, of course there are more Indians in Kenya than um, Britons so the inevitable consequence will be Indian rule and the well the British don't want that and the Indians are saying oh yeah I thought uh, all the dominions were equal. In uh, Merthyr, in South Wales, uh, there's a strike, uh, a mining strike, a mine strike. Um, this is not to do with pay, it's not to do with conditions, it is to do with the presence of some miners who are not members of the union. This is very common at this time. It was certainly very common before the First World War. Uh, you'd have lots of strikes on this. And it's very interesting to me to notice, uh, to note that this was something that unions wanted to establish at a very early stage. That uh, if you were going to work in this industry, any industry, it could be mining, it could be steel, whatever, uh, you would have to be a uh, a member of the union. This is known as the closed shop. Um, and was still a big issue in the 1970s. It is perhaps worth pointing out that almost all the industries in which you've got a closed shop um, are pretty much non-existent nowadays. On Friday, there was an article about Hong Kong. This is what it had to say. Extraordinarily complex as the situation has been, and still is, there seems to be no limit to the booming growth and activity of Hong Kong. It asserts itself on every hand, in the population and revenue statistics, on the harbour where daily the buoys and anchorages and wharves are crowded with the merchant ships of many nations, on the steep hill slopes which are rapidly filling with modern buildings, on the mainland where industries are springing up and no sooner born than they have to be extended. This is... Um, this is something of a challenge to me, because the story that tends to go around in free market circles is that after the Second World War, uh, Hong Kong was a bit of a, ba a backwater and was saved by a civil servant by the name of uh, John Cowperthwaite, who, when Britain was embracing socialism, embraced free market economics, and the result was that Hong Kong boomed. 
what this article is suggesting that is that actually Hong Kong is that actually Hong Kong was doing just fine before um, Cabothwaite came along, um, and it's certainly and I would certainly assume that it's being run on very much a free market basis, even in the 1920s. Also on Friday, we had the news that there was going to be a royal charter for the FBI. Now, if that sounds confusing, because the FBI is an American institution, uh, there's a very simple reason. Uh, they don't mean the Federal Bureau of Investigation. They mean the Federation of British Industry, uh, which uh, will later become the uh, Confederation of British Industry, or the CBI. The CBI getting a royal charter. Now, that really couldn't happen today. On Saturday, there was uh, a letter uh, all about the uh, proposed naval base at Singapore. And uh, the correspondent had this to say. Without this base, our Navy, according to the Admiralty, would be unable to protect British possessions in the Eastern Hemisphere. To which I'm inclined to ask, is that true? Because, of course, um, the base was lost in... 1942. <laughs> Rather spectacularly as it happened. Of course, uh, Britain did not lose, uh, well it lost Burma, it lost Malaysia, it didn't lose, uh, or Malaya as it was known then, it did not lose India, and it lost Hong Kong, but there's no way it's ever going to keep Hong Kong, I don't think. Uh, but then again, of course, the Americans were involved. So, difficult to say. Anyway, uh, it, it didn't have much role to play, let's put it like that. On Saturday, there was also a story about uh, forged £1 notes, uh, another example of uh, counterfeiting going on. This week, the uh, Times published a series of articles from a special correspondent about the situation in the Soviet Union. This is from an editorial from Monday the 4th of June. The real communists are few, and their numbers are shrinking. Even the interested pretense of sympathy with communism is now passing out of fashion. The tiny oligarchy, groping in the vacuum caused by the loss of their leader, they mean Lenin, are desperately trying to recover and ensure their control. Which, of course, may well be true, but um, it's not sufficient. Anyway, from the same edition, here is what, the, what their correspondent has to say. He describes a scene at one of the big communist gatherings and its inspiring effect on some of the attendees, especially those from rural areas. But before we laugh at these simple-minded communist deputies, hypnotised by a piece of red rag, we should seriously ask ourselves, are we immune from the same hypnotism? I do not think that we all are. A certain section of politicians in this and most other countries seems to have developed, after a period of extreme self-assertion, a strange tendency towards self-effacement, a craze for self-immolation. I must confess, I'm not quite sure what he means here, but anyway, he goes on. An intense longing for something inhuman, heavy and infinitely strong, to crush them, destroy their free will, and take from them the whole direction of their lives. It occurs to me it's probably... Um, one part and not the other. I think they want uh, someone to run their lives for them, but they also want to retain their free will, not realising that um, you, know, you can't have the one without the other. He goes on. The victims of this inexplicable malady worship force, so long as that force calls itself the instrument of the people, or by some similar name, and they take no pains to investigate whether it really represents the people or not. Couldn't happen today. He goes on, the best cure for this disease is Bolshevism. Bolshevism in practice is an unfailing remedy for Bolshevism in theory. If only, if only that were the case. But it never is, because it's never real Bolshevism. The truth is that Bolshevism or communism or socialism or whatever you want to call it, is a religion. On Thursday, the special correspondent talks about the situation of housing in Moscow. It is most difficult to prevent strangers being quartered on one, and these strangers are generally the worst specimens of red workmen, 
permanently workless, and in addition dirty and quarrelsome, or the worst type of Jewish student. I think that deserves some explanation. I think a lot of this, and, and certainly in reading the context of this, uh, a lot of the world, a lot of the communist world is dominated effectively by, well, the sort of student activist you probably met at university if you went to university. Very, um, very loud, uh, very sure of themselves, very articulate. And I'm sure in Russia a lot of them were Jewish because, uh, well, let's face it, Jews tend to be rather smart or Jews are on average quite smart. And Jews were oppressed under, under the Tsars. So Bolshevism represented a way of um, bettering themselves, for want of a better term. Anyway, he goes on. Cultured people of good family and former wealth are especially liable to be thus persecuted by Bolshevist officials, who seem intent on destroying every vestige of decency and civilization. I know dozens of respectable people who have had persons eminently undesirable forced upon them, with the result that their home privacy has been utterly ruined. And then in an echo of very modern concerns, he says... Bolshevism is a levelling down instead of a levelling up, and they're getting down to a really low level. On Friday he says this, Valuable mahogany furniture has been burned for fuel. Doorknobs, electric fittings, locks, hooks, watercocks, marble mantelpieces, water closets, window glass and even nails have been wrenched from their places and sold in the market. You just know that the commonest solution to all this is to close down the markets. Anyway, I, if you do get the chance, I would recommend you read the whole thing because it's really quite disturbing. Anyway, that's all for this week. I aim to have something up next week, but I promise nothing.